So, have you, uh, have you seen the construction just over here on Ridgegate? If you're driving east on, you know, of I-25 right there on Ridgegate, if you look out your window, you know something's happening. I mean, the amount of land those excavators are clearing is rather staggering. And uh, Lone Tree has plans, a, a master plan, they're calling it. They are going to put in a city center with businesses and there's going to be over 8,000 new homes, all with light rail access, walking trails, parks to enjoy, the whole deal. All right. Now, I'm from Maine. Okay. I grew up in a town of 9,000. We had to drive 15 minutes to get to the biggest city in the state of 66,000. All right. That's like the size of Castle Rock. So this idea of uh, a utopian paradise where you got city living, suburbia, and the great outdoors all coming together, it blows my mind. I, I don't have anything to like, you know, register what's going on here. But as somebody who prides myself as a planner, I love it. I'm all about it. Now, master planning a new community like Ridgegate, that's way beyond my pay grade, but I like to master plan my life. You know, in the past, it was the college I'd attend, the degree I would seek, who I would marry and what she would be like. Nowadays, it's what my family's going to look like, my career, my goals. At the beginning of the year, I plan my year. At the beginning of the quarter, I plan the quarter. At the beginning of my week, I plan the week. And at the beginning of the day, yes, I plan the day. And if you don't believe me, just ask my wife or my coworkers, and they will testify that I'm an, an obsessive planner. I like to think of myself as a master planner. It depends on who you ask. After all, the saying goes, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail, right? Except we've all experienced planning and still failing. So what do we do with that? Like, you may not be all about planning. You may not nerd out on planning like I do. But we all have plans. It could be the degree you're seeking. It could be where you want to go on vacation, what you're going to eat that week. It could be a multitude of things, where you want to retire. But while we all have plans, we've also all had plans fail. We wanted to have kids, but couldn't. We had a dream, but COVID killed it. We wanted to buy a house. We've been saving and saving and saving but there's nothing on the market, not in our price range. Whether we consider ourselves master planners or not, we live in a world where we do plan, whether it's for small things or for big things, and sometimes our plans fail. So how do we navigate this space? Uh, throughout this series, we've been asking a simple question. We've asked it in all different realms of life, and we're going to ask it in this realm, in the realm of planning. What is the wise thing to do? Like when it comes to planning, what is the wise thing to do? I don't, know, I don't know about you, but like I'm eager for this answer and to experience it all the more in my life because like I'm over planning and planning and planning only to have those plans not really matter. So what does successful planning look like? And as we go about this, seeking the answer to this question, here's what I don't think we need. I don't think we need a motivational talk on how to plan. Okay, there's plenty of those out there. What we need is we need a word from God about successful planning because unlike our plans, God's plans always succeed. They always happen just as he intended. So let's hear from God. Let's open his word. And to do that, we're actually going to be in Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. You can open your Bible there now, or if you need, uh, you can follow along in our free church app. There's a place you can jot down notes as well as follow along. Now, as we prepare to read God's word and hear from the true master planner about successful planning, wise planning, would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray and ask to hear from him. Lord, we come before you eager to hear from you. We all have a different starting point today as to where we're at in our relationship with you, where we're at in faith, and yet we're hungry, we're eager, we want to grow. And right now we ask that you would specifically grow us in wise planning. Would you please reveal your will and your way to us so that we can plan wisely, so we can plan with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, Proverbs 16, 1 through 9. I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we'll reference different pieces of it throughout. It says, To humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. The Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked, for a day of disaster. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. And to close it out, Verse 9, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Now, this passage is clear, and it really confirms what our life experience tells us. Our plans fail. And because our plans fail, what do we do? Well, if you're like me, you try harder. You, you evaluate what went wrong. You adjust the plan, you perfect it, and then put more effort behind it. Or maybe you have a different approach. Maybe you just throw your hands up in the air and you're like, this pl- I can't do it. Like, I'm done planning. They never work out the way I thought. Whether, whether we, we you know, apply more effort or we quit planning altogether, here's what we presume. We presume the problem with our planning is our plans. But what God reveals is our problem is our pride. I mean, just look at verses 2 and 5 again says, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. And then in verse 5, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go go unpunished. The problem isn't our plans, the problem is our pride, which is harder to grapple with, isn't it? Because that's personal. We think that we're the master planner of our life, that we get to determine our days, that what we say goes. And sometimes what we say does go, but sometimes what we say doesn't go. Because what Scripture teaches us is that while we have a say, God has the say. The passage we just read put it this way, verses 4 and 9. The Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. The concept here is that God is sovereign. Now that's kind of a churchy word that means God is all powerful. He's in control. Things are gonna happen and, and, and he's over all of it. Now the tension that we all live in, whether we follow Jesus or not, the tension we all live in is that God is sovereign. He is over all and He's given us free choice, which means God is the master planner, and then he he invites us to plan along the way. James, the the half-brother of Jesus, describes this problem of pride in planning this way. If you flip with me to James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, say this, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, It is sin for them. Planning apart from God, the master planner, it's going to result in one thing. It's going to result in failure. Now, some of our plans, they might come about, but we're going to fail in a much bigger way, a much greater way. Because we don't know the future. We don't don't know what's coming. Uh, COVID, did you see that coming? Because I sure didn't. Uh, Way back in 2019, excuse me, 2018, 
uh, Amanda and I went, we felt like God was calling us to start a church. So we went through this church planting assessment process, met with other pastors, people who've planted churches, understand what it takes to, to start a church and, and had a very extensive interview process to understand like, is God calling us to this now? And they, they gave us a green light. They're like, yeah, go for it. We think God's calling you to this. You guys should move to South Denver, get rocking and rolling. So as we prepared to move, I also prepared for this and I went through a residency program. It was like a distance residency thing where we got to hear from experts from around the country on different areas of leading a church and starting a church. So at the end of this whole thing, I have a 20 plus page project plan. Okay, it's like outlining everything from how we're gonna fundraise to what it looks like to get connected and the outreach things, all the, th all the things, all right, are in this, okay? And we move here in 2019, summer of 2019, and get settled, and then we launch two community groups. Just like the plan says, we launch two community groups. It's awesome, God's moving, people are getting baptized. It is like so exciting. 2019, January comes around, and those two groups multiply to four groups. We're like, yeah, this plan is working. I, I, we're preparing for September. That's when we're gonna start gathering here in person. I'm like my decade old dream is starting to take shape. And then March of 2020, and like you and the rest of the world, we got punched in the face by a pandemic. And this thing, this thing's meaningless. Like it is, it doesn't mean a thing anymore. No one's done this. So here we are. And that's why Proverbs 27 says this. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. We don't know the future, so we can't boast about the future. We can't boast about our plans coming about just like we planned. We just can't go there because we haven't been there. We don't know what's to come. And as we read earlier in James, our lives, they're like a mist. We're here for a moment and then it just vanishes. Now, while our lives are temporary, God is eternal. He exists outside of time. He experiences time different than we do. And God's, God's word is very clear about God's will and his way. And his word teaches that if we disregard him, even in our brief life here on earth, he's gonna disregard us for all of eternity. But that doesn't have to be the end of our story because God's word also teaches us that he has made a way for us to have a life with him, a relationship with him. And, and when we have a relationship with him now, we get to enjoy that for all of eternity. And it impacts how we live in the here and the now. We don't have to like meaningly, meaninglessly wander through life. We get to pursue God's plans. We get to realize his purposes for us, his purposes accomplished through us. But what keeps us from following Jesus is the same thing that that trips us up in our planning, our pride. And, and what we think is, oh, I'm a good person. You know, I'm not as bad as them. I, I can make it happen. I, I don't need God. Now, while this, this problem is pride, the solution to our, our salvation, our relationship with God, our solution to our planning, it's actually the same thing. Our solution is surrender. Back in Proverbs 16, verses four through six, they say it this way. The Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. You see, uh, disaster, punishment, that doesn't have to be our story because God made a way. And the ultimate expression of love and faithfulness is the person of Jesus. And Jesus was part of God's plan from the beginning. And Jesus stands in the gap where our sin keeps us from experiencing life with God. Jesus stands in the gap and he helps us connect with God. The relationship we're all designed to experience. And now we can live life with him. We can live in partnership with the master planner, 
So we don't just have to plan flippantly, we could plan strategically, wisely. Uh, pride is, is basically a warped view of ourself. But what Jesus does is he kind of puts our, our view of ourself in perspective once again. He gives us a proper view of self. He helps us live humbly. And, and since we're surrendered to Jesus, many of us are surrendered to Jesus, we should be surrendered in our planning as well. Not just surrendered for our salvation, but also surrendered for the way we're going to live each and every day. This is how we are going to experience successful planning. Because, like we've said, our plans fail. Uh, you want the relationship to continue, but he breaks it off. You're in line for the promotion and you walk into the office because you think you're getting it and then you realize your coworker did. Uh, you receive the diagnosis. Like when these things happen, when, when things happen that aren't our plan, what's our hope? Like how do we make sense of this? Proverbs 19.21 says this, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Though our plans fail, God's purpose prevails. That's what we can rest in when things don't go our way, when our plans disintegrate, when they become obsolete. While our plans fail, God's plans are, they're going to prevail. They will. None of us want to play a game that uh, we're doomed to lose. So if you want to play a game you're doomed to lose, just compete with God in your planning. But we don't have to compete with God. We can actually collaborate with Him. And that's the joy of it. You see, the plans, that's just like a context for something so much better. It's a context to experience God, to grow in a relationship with Him, to demonstrate more and more surrender. It's not probably what you were expecting when you're like, well, we're talking about planning today. But that's what, that's what plans are. That's why God gives us the, the freedom to plan. While at the same time, his purpose is what's going to actually take place. And the amazing thing, the amazing thing is that when we plan with God, who cares that we don't know it all? Who cares that we aren't powerful enough? Like, it doesn't matter. God is. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful, and he is always good. So instead of being all stressed about things not going our way, we get to rest in the one who's in control, knowing that while it might not look good now, and it certainly doesn't feel good now, one day God's purpose will prevail. And then we have a beautiful picture of what that's going to look like. There's going to be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain or suffering. All of the effects of sin, God is going to wipe away one day. That's our hope. That, that God is going to make it all right. So let's, with the remaining time, let's talk about what does it look like to like practically live this out? How do you plan in conjunction with God? What does that look like? Well, it starts with this, plan prayerfully. Back in Proverbs 16, verse 3, it says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. Uh, we, we, talk with our, we talk with our coworkers about our plans, talk with our, our spouse about our plans, our friends about our plans, but do you talk with God about His plans? I mean, if we're, if we're after planning with God, shouldn't we like talk to Him about His plans? Seems simple, and yet there are days where I, I plan and I, I plan by myself. And sometimes those days don't go as I planned. I think of... Uh, Back in, in 2020, uh, you know, that was a crazy year for all of us. And between Christmas and New Year's, I was just like at the end of myself. I, we, we had pivoted so many times. I mean, our mission was clear, but everything else we had to like pivot on, okay? As COVID just totally upended our world. And <clears throat> Tyler, Jake, and I, uh, you know, we gave our best. We were trying, we we're trying to come up with things. You guys provided insight. You know, we're planning for one thing and then it changes and so on. I mean, it doesn't look anything like that project plan, right? That's just not how the Connect Church came to be. But we're, 
We're between Christmas and New Year's of 2020, and I'm just like, I'm spent, <clears throat> totally spent. And I, I'm reading scripture, and I'm convicted, actually, by this verse, by Proverbs 16, 3. And I'm thinking, you know what? I don't want to live another day where my planning and my prayer life aren't like super intersected because I'm sick of like pursuing things, even good things, but it just like, you know, getting so excited about the plan, but then it doesn't look that way. And it's like, I, I miss the joy and the journey or something. So I, uh, I decide, all right, you know what? This year, 2021, New Year's resolution, I want my planning and my prayer life to intersect like never before. I've always prided myself as a planner. I enjoy praying. I wanna see these come together in a greater way. So what I do, I go buy a new like annual planner, all right, with some questions each day. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to experience God in this fresh way and it's going to be really, really helpful. It's going to be game changing for us. So I do this whole thing for like, I go through this planner pretty diligently for a couple months. And I, uh, I discovered something about myself. I'm not only an obsessive planner, I am apparently a planner snob because I go through this thing and in my humble opinion or not so humble opinion, it stunk. Like the questions were terrible. I was like, this isn't helping me at all. So what did I do? I wrote my own planner. Okay. I know if you didn't think I was cool already, <laughs> just won you over. We can be friends. Actually, my friends don't even really, many of them know that I wrote this planner because I still want them as friends. And <laughs> what I did, I did. I'm just being honest with you. I wrote this planner and Here's what I learned through this whole process. You don't have to write a planner to see your, your planning and your prayer life intersect in a greater way. God's plan for us is way better than that. And the lift is a lot less. You see, you don't have to write a planner because God's plan is that when you receive Jesus, he gives you his spirit to dwell inside of you, the Holy Spirit, God's very presence in us who are following Jesus. And his spirit prompts us in what we should pray. It redirects us when we're taking a wrong step. It tugs us back when we've gone too far on something. It's the Holy Spirit, God's gift to us. So my challenge for all of us, myself included, is let's engage the Holy Spirit all the more as we plan our weeks, as we plan our vacations, our retirement, whatever it is we're praying. Now, praying for it. Now, this could be seriously as easy. It doesn't have to be complicated. This can be as easy as you know, praying really quick as you're walking into the meeting at work. It could be uh, going before God with your spouse to talk to him about his plans for your family. It could be uh, talking to God about that dream that's been on your, your heart, your mind, that you've been mulling over, maybe you've been losing some sleep over. And what if you took some time and you talked to God about it? See if that's his dream that he's placed on your heart or the pizza you ate. The proverb says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. So we're gonna be people who plan prayerfully. And then the second thing is plan with an open hand. That's another huge lesson that I've learned over the last couple of years. Like we can plan prayerfully and at the same time, we still don't know the future any more than we did when we started praying. So part of that, that engaging with God in the process is we've got we to hold the plan with an open hand because the plan isn't God. God is still God, but we got to hold this with an open hand so we, could, we can pursue it. But if he's going to redirect, we've got to be redirectable. We've got to go where he's leading. We've got to be willing to pivot when it's time to pivot. Earlier, we read in, in Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. My story over the last uh, couple of years, and hopefully I pray my life, uh, but even really our story over the last couple of years is though, though the plans have looked different than I thought originally, God's purpose is prevailing through his church, through you all. And that is, that's a testament not to me, that's a testament to him. He's gonna work in challenging situations to accomplish good things. 
That's the hope that we have as we follow him. As we plan, it's tempting to hold tightly to the plan. We put time, effort, energy, blood, sweat, tears into this plan. And we want to see it happen. It's our plan, right? It's tempting to hold tightly to the plan. But what God is inviting us to do is not hold tightly to the plan, but to hold tightly to him, the master planner. And when we hold tightly to him and not our plan, that's when we move from that position of stressed to a position of of just rest. Because we don't have to have it all figured out. We don't have to have it all under control. So once we've planned prayerfully and planned with an open hand, we got to pursue God's plan. That's point number three. Proverbs 21, 5 says, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Throughout this series, we've talked about diligence as the uh, ability to do the important thing, even when it's the hard thing. So when it comes to planning, what could this look like? Well, if God's plan for you is to get a degree, that is probably going to mean you have to say no to going away for the weekend with friends because you've got to write that paper. If God's plan for you is to raise a family, uh, uh, you know, kids who know, love, and follow him, then that means you're going to have to discipline them when they are disobedient instead of just caving to their complaining. Uh, For me, diligence looks like being really intentional about loving whoever's right in front of me. That's what I'm focusing on this year. I want to love the person right in front of me. Whether I'm preaching like this, it's preaching to you all. Whether it's at coffee and there's someone across from me, I want to be really dialed in and present with them. If it's at home, I want to be really present with my girls or my wife. Living a life of diligence like this, it's hard. It's hard in relationships. It's hard with money. It's hard when we're pursuing plans. And this is why God gives us his spirit, remember? This isn't about our strength. This is about God's spirit working in us, giving us the strength, giving us the perseverance to continue when we want to quit. So when it comes to executing plans, what is, God does the heavy lifting for us, and in Proverbs 16, 7 says it best. When the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. So what do you say? Like, what if, we, what if we took off our master planner hat? We let God wear that hat. And instead of, of trying to compete with him, we choose to collaborate with him. Instead of living stressed, we experience rest. After all, it's surrendered planning that's successful planning. Let me pray for us. God, would you help us in this? We need your help. Whether we call ourselves planners or not, we want to experience success in planning and the ultimate success being a growing relationship with you through the highs, through the lows, through the successes and the failures. And Lord, would you help us to to ease our grip on our plans and instead hold tightly to you, live fully surrendered, fully fully committed to you, trusting you in the process, even when it doesn't make sense, even when we can't see what's coming. Would you help us to grow in our trust and in that our surrender? In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. We hope that the message encouraged your faith. If it did, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend to encourage them too. My name's Chris. I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Connect Church, where we believe that life with Jesus and life with others is best. That's why we exist as a church to connect the disconnected to a growing relationship with God. And we do that in a couple of ways. First is help you connect with Jesus through our weekly services. Second, connect with people through joining a community group where you can make some friends and grow in your faith. And third, connect people with Jesus by serving and sharing your story with others. I hope to see you at a worship service soon. And in the meantime, be sure to download our free church app by searching Connect Church Community in your phone's app store. The app is the best way to stay up on everything that's going on around Connect. Let us know how we can help you get connected by filling out a Connect card, find a group, and even give to help see this mission and ministry advance so that more lives can be touched with the good news of Jesus. You can connect with God, community, and your purpose, and we're here to help. See you soon.